and especially to feature what is the division of the month, um, the emergency medicine division. And we're not only a top 10 clinical hospital, but we're a top 10 academic hospital also. And our grand rounds um, are our showcase uh, conference. And so we welcome you all today and hope that you'll be frequent visitors on time at 8 o'clock. And uh, so we'd like to introduce, I'd like to introduce our speaker, um, not our speaker, but our, um, our uh, one of our uh, newest um, uh, directors, uh, Dr. Joelle Simpson, who's a graduate of our Emergency Medicine Fellowship Program, who's now the Medical Director for Emergency Preparedness. And since this is Emergency Preparedness Month, welcome. So we're very excited to have the first Grand Rounds of the year. Um, and today's speaker, I have the honor of introducing. Um, this is Dr. Stephen Krug that will be talking to us today. Um, most notably, a graduate of the Children's National Residency Program, so this can be you in a few years. He is Professor of Pediatrics at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and heads the Division of Emergency Medicine at the Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. He is a chairperson for the American Academy of Pediatrics Disaster Preparedness Council um, and is the past chair of the Pediatric Emergency Medicine on the Section for Emergency Medicine. Um, he is an active persistent participant both on the local and national level for the EMS for Children's program, which as many of you know is uh, based here at Children's National. Uh, and he is presently serving as the chair of the National Preparedness and Response Science Board, which is a federal advisory committee to the Department of Health and Human Services Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response uh, Division. So welcome, Dr. Krug. We look forward to your talk. Did I do the right thing here? Okay, good. There we go. Well, good morning. Um, not a bad showing at uh, 8.04. Uh, my uh, past department chair, he just retired, uh, was always the person who made sure that we started on time. He would um, give you that look at about 8.02. Uh, so um, <clears throat> it's great to come and talk about today's topic for all of the reasons that were just uh, explained by uh, um, my, my colleague. And uh, the Children's Hospital here is uniquely positioned. Uh, you, you, you sort of are in the middle of uh, the nation's capital. You're also sort of here, sort of in the center of the nation. So I think, um, and, and, and there's been some great work done here, and also some fabulous work in the advocacy arena uh, that we should all be very proud of. Um, this is kind of a, an updated talk. I, I really revised this talk in sort of the hope that I might make it fresher and also leveraging the fact that it's been literally 10 years now uh, since uh, Katrina. Um, I'm a pediatrician, so I really own very little. Uh, so uh, this is an easy one. Um, I have some ambitious objectives. Um, I'm going to remind you that disasters are a uh, really a prevalent public health concern. So it's it's no longer just sort of a boutique area. If, if you're interested in the health and well-being of children and families, you need to pay attention to this. Because I'm an emergency physician and because of my work with EMSC, I'm going to also talk a little bit about the link between day-to-day -day preparedness. Uh, and again, you guys are quite prepared on a day-to-day -day basis and, and disaster readiness and talk to you a little bit about the gaps. Um, I'm going to try and give you an overview of the progress that's been made over the past decade and point out those places where we still have some issues. Um, and some of those are listed on the slide here. And then I'm going to try and inspire you uh, to um, seize those opportunities, whether it's in your local environment, your, your your children's hospital, whether it's in the community that you live, uh, D.C., Virginia, or Maryland, um, and, and those opportunities that exist not just for the hospital-based pediatrician, but also even perhaps more important for the community-based pediatrician, um, 
the importance of personal readiness because it's something you probably should do to protect your families, but also to sort of, you, you can't help others if you have a family to worry about. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about resiliency because the sad reality is that disasters are not going away. They're actually becoming more frequent. And then if I have time, I have two endings to this presentation, um, the short one and the long one. Uh, I, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about advocacy because uh, that's been my area of uh, great personal growth over the past couple of decades. And um, you really can make a difference. And I mean, look where you're located. I mean, what could be better? Uh, so I thought I'd poke a little fun at the bear. And as, as Jim noted, and actually I just noticed on this slide, I have two versions of the bear, the, 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 the one with little dots in the eyes and the one that apparently has glaucoma. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, and, and there was intelligent life uh, pre-bear. Uh, um, um, one of the great things, and I noticed you're doing some renovation in the lobby, is, is the visits that you that you guys have every year from the first family, and, and here are the Obamas, and uh, that, w that must be pretty cool, kind of joyful and fun. Well, this is what we had to deal with. <laughs> uh, she's carrying a bear, but she doesn't look very happy to be there, does she? Uh, uh, my goodness, uh, those those were the days. Uh, but but it, it goes back to at least then and perhaps earlier than that. Um, so uh, evidence of life before the bear, uh, that's me in the middle, that's uh, Dr. Einhorn, a couple of rows back, um, and uh, 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 note the interesting attire and the hairstyles and whatnot, but uh, there, there's a great legacy here in terms of the training of pediatricians. Yeah, there's Joe Wright, you can see a, a few other notables here. Um, and you should be proud of that. So those of you who are training here, <clears throat> you're part of a great family and legacy. And for those of you who, who've done all that teaching and supervision of trainees, you should feel proud of what you're achieving. And uh, that is me. That's very, very scary. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Back on topic. So uh, Katrina <clears throat> is still the largest natural disaster in the history of the United States. Uh, there are many greater disasters um, internationally than Katrina, and, and, and in some ways, although Katrina was enormous, it, it pales in comparison to some of those super disasters. But um, 90 square miles of uh, federal disaster declarations, uh, close to 2,000 people lost their lives. Nobody really knows how many people were injured. Uh, over a million citizens displaced from their homes, and uh, the last figure I saw for cost was about $140 billion. And uh, if you've been to New Orleans, you know that it's, they're not yet done. Uh, they may never be done. Um, Katrina was enormous in scope. So in, in fairness to all the involved parties, we have to give them a little, a little sort of slack for that. But it, it clearly uh, underscored the problems we had at that time in our disaster response system. Uh, first of all, you had a, a really mediocre local and state disaster response entity. It, it was awful. Uh, it also occurred in a community and other communities where there were high rates of poverty. Uh, and um, you then had uh, an inadequate and kind of slow response by the federal government. And then last, really horrible coordination of effort amongst all the involved parties. And in fact, there are there only a few bright lights here, and those few bright, bright lights actually came from the private sector, not from the public sector. So lots to learn from this uh, for both uh, uh, adults and kids. Um, and again, just some memories here. I mean, there were, I mean, the hospitals didn't get knocked over. They were still there when the storm ended. and. Uh, the problem is the game plan back there was to have 48 to 72 hours worth of stuff. Well, uh, what do you do when the 48 to 72 hours of stuff runs out and the federal government's still not there yet? Uh, but even in the city, uh, there was um, sort of a little violence going on and, and hospitals were evacuated not because of water or power, but because 
they feared their lives. Uh, so uh, public safety was a huge problem. There was really no plan for the care and evacuation of hospitalized children. Um, and in fact, a lot of that was done by the private sector. Uh, a group of children's hospitals <clears throat> responded with their transport teams and evacuated a lot of these kids. And you can see, you know, there are pictures out there of people evacuating children in rowboats and odd stuff like that. And um, again, um, what happened happened despite the fact that the feds and the locals really had given this any thought. Um, no strategy for the evacuation of children with families. Uh, there were a lot of kids that were uh, separated by, from their family members, not just because they were in a different location when the storm hit, but because they went on different buses to different locations. And then everybody struggled to reunify the kids and their family members. Um, um, and this is especially an issue with infants and toddlers. And this is still an issue today, but this is a learning opportunity, which is you have to anticipate this. Uh, if you've ever, if you can recall those images of the Superdome and the awful stuff that was going on there at the convention center in downtown, um, again, really no, no plan, uh, no plan to deal with the enormous mental health impact. Uh, and again, uh, I'm sure it's true here that the baseline system and resources for mental health care is probably not all that great to begin with. So add a disaster on top of that, right? And then one of the biggest hits and one of the long sort of lasting hits, uh, the two long lasting hits, one's the, the mental health problem. The other problem is that the medical home washed away for many communities. And some pediatricians who even tried to kind of get themselves restarted were unable to do so. And, and they, they went away. They left. They couldn't afford to restart their practices. Um, a lot of kids were displaced. Um, I've seen different numbers about the number of missing children, uh, most say over 5,000, and it took six months to get the last child reunited with a family member. Now, some of these children lost their family members, so there was an added degree of difficulty there. Uh, school is such an important, important of, uh, such an important part of a child's existence day to day. You can argue, what do you want to maintain? One of them would be schools. Well, if you're not going to school for the entire year, just imagine the impact. And I'm not talking about the scholastic impact. And I think this is a gross underestimation in terms of about a third of children experiencing clinically diagnosed mental health problems. So there's good data to demonstrate that um, the vast majority of those suffering mental health problems actually never got care. Um, and, and you wonder about the impact on the kids who are now becoming adults or are adults. Um, so an enormous problem. So if you've been wondering whether the incidence of disasters is increasing worldwide, um, here's some data to perhaps demonstrate to you that, in fact, you are right. Um, there's some fluctuation year to year, but if you go back far enough, there's a clear increase. Um, so it's not just bad luck, it's not just storms seem to be a little more potent. Uh, um, and so this gets back to the point I'm making, which is that this is something that's becoming so prevalent, and not just in certain places. Uh, the earth just doesn't shake in California, as an example, you know, the, the, you know storms only hit the coast of Florida. So. We really need to think about this, uh, um, and this this data does not uh, look at the terrorism component, so the man-made piece. So you can add a little extra height to the bars there. There's some data. This uh, the Guardian every year publishes some data on uh, base, uh, worldwide uh, disaster displacements, and as you can see in 2012. I think the number for 2013 and 14 were a little lower, but in 2012 there were 30, 32.4 million people displaced around the globe from disasters. So again, this is this is an enormous impact affecting almost all areas on the earth. So um, again, something that we need to do. And again, if you have a global perspective of the world, and I know that this institution takes great pride in that. We have an obligation to provide support, not just in our local environment, but also um, internationally. Uh, why is this happening? Well, uh, although there's still debate on Capitol Hill about whether there's climate change, uh, I'm pretty sure that there's strong data demonstrating that climate change is indeed occurring. 
and also some sad data that would suggest that some of it is irreversible. Um, uh, people who live in large cities along the coast are at risk. People who live in river flood zones are at risk. Uh, and for some reason, we all seem to like to, to congregate in those areas, and this is what we get. Uh, Emerging infectious disease, this has been the past couple of years, I think have been a stark reminder of the fact that uh, both the common diseases like influenza or enterovirus uh, and the uh, rare ones like Ebola are things that we need to be prepared for. We're highly dependent upon te technology and so whether it occurs naturally or because somebody is hacking a system somewhere, uh, this creates a problem. Um, the other problem we face is that the resources that are available to us, whether it's in your average children's hospital, and this is more than an average children's hospital, of course, but or in the federal government are not where they used to be. So we've got to fix all these problems and do this with less resources than we had a decade ago. That's a real challenge. And then on top of everything, and this is was so true in, with Katrina, is when you when you add crisis or disaster on top of poverty and poor health status, it it uh, it, it really really uh, is a big hit. So kids are small, but they're a big problem. They're a quarter of the population. Um, the federal government likes to lump kids into a group called the at risk population. Uh, I I view that as sort of an unfortunate. Uh, collection of folks who then sort of get ignored uh, in, in many ways. And um, one of the things we've been trying to do at the national level is to remind our elected officials that this is a quarter of the population. And the good news is everybody likes kids, so we, we, we have that advantage. Uh, well over half of the families in the United States have been affected by some disasters. Believe it or not, and this, this data has come out repeatedly, about 40% of families have no disaster plan. So here's an opportunity for pediatricians um, and family physicians. And I mean, if folks had a plan, it's not going to prevent the disaster, but maybe it reduces the impact. Um, the other problem is that nearly 70 million kids are separated from their family members every day because they, they're doing stuff like school, child care. Uh, that's an enormous problem if something bad happens during that time. And uh, that puts those kids at risk and, again, should compel us to be prepared for that and to deal with things such as reunification. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, kids constitute about 20% of ED visits and certainly if they're being seen here at your awesome emergency department, they're being seen by folks who are, that's what they do every day, they're quite good at it. The majority of the kids nationwide are seen in facilities that see very few kids a day, and it's like what happens when they bring us an adult with chest pain. I've taken ACLS, I know what I'm supposed to do, kind of. Uh, they, sort of the opposite occurs when sick kids and or very sick kids are seen in community hospitals. It's not like, it's, it's what happens when you don't practice. You don't, you don't, you don't get good at it. Um, so uh, this is a disturbing picture, actually. I apologize. Uh, so you notice all the, the um, book bags. Uh, so this is a, uh, a, a photo taken. Uh, there's a Chinese artist and activist, A. Wei Wei. I think I just mispronounced his name. But uh, uh, the Sichuan earthquake uh, in uh, May of 2008 uh, um, Several thousand people lost their lives. Uh, about uh, a couple of thousand kids lost their lives as well. And the reason why the kids were disproportionately affected by this is because it occurred during the week, during a school day. And the other thing that they figured out, um, this is uh, actually an exhibit that was at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. This is rebar. Uh, and uh, the artist straightened them out. Um, and this is sort of an interesting display, but what they figured out is that the schools had been put together and the rebar was inserted improperly. Have you ever been by a building where the rebar has like a curve at the end? I've learned that helps to kind of keep things together, but if it's put in straight when the ground shakes, the buildings just kind of crumble. So that's what happened in China. Uh, <clears throat> so again, children can be uniquely affected. So this is the one slide I have to explain to you the differences between children and adults, and I think you guys probably know this. Uh, so
so we'll we'll we'll, we'll move on. But uh, again, um, part of what we need to do is to remind well-intended individuals, whether they are responsible for local response or whether they're elected or appointed officials, that those differences translate to different needs. And you know this, uh, the answer is no, of course you can't have a single plan for all victims, but after Katrina, that was the that was the reaction and the response, all hazard plan for all victims, and that's better than no plan, um, but it, uh, it minimized the needs of kids. Um, so putting on my EMSC hat and my emergency physician hat, um, again, I, I guess I've talked about rebar, and now I'm talking about a house. Uh, so both of my children are aspiring architects, so maybe maybe there is a connection there. But um, if you've ever, and this is not my home because I don't have a house like this, but if you built a house on the beach and you're worried about tidal surge, what you would do is you would build it on a strong foundation on stilts so that when the waves came through, and it's hard to build something that resists the waves, uh, maybe the house stays. Um, and so the, the, what I'm making the point here is, is that you can't have a strong all-hazard casualty event readiness if you have a crappy day-to-day -day emergency response system. And that's true generically, and that's obviously also true if you're not addressing the needs of kids. Because if you can't take care of a single kid who is very sick, how could you possibly take care of two, three, 20, 30? Um, and that's what, again, through the EMSC program that we've been working on and, and colleagues here have been working on for a long time. And uh, this is uh, sort of a relatively old comment from the uh, IOM report on emergency care for children, but um, it's still fair to say today that the playing field is very uneven for kids in terms of day-to-day -day readiness, although things have improved in many states and even here in the District of Columbia. Um, and the foundation is not just because there's inadequate pediatric readiness, but because there are problems with your average emergency department right now. Your average emergency department is oversubscribed, uh, too many patients, not enough space, not enough providers. Uh, the, the, the emergency response systems are underfunded, I mean woefully underfunded, um, and uh, then we're asked to sort of flip a switch and respond to the needs of 100 people. It's uh, really hard to do that. Um, it's a good read, even though it's now uh, eight years old, uh, the, the IOM report. So how are we doing? Uh, this is data from the National Hospital Inventory Medical Care Survey. It's uh, a periodic survey that's done by the CDC, and they have a representative sample of hospitals that they survey periodically asking a variety of questions. With this survey, they actually added questions regarding disaster readiness, and they actually took from the, uh, actually kind of borrowed these questions or these uh, metrics from uh, an AAP policy statement looking at components of disaster readiness. Um, and as you can see in this sample, which is a representative sample of emergency depart hospital-based emergency departments nationally, the components of a plan for kids, not great. My, actually, my, my favorite com data point here is that uh, it's surprising. I thought all hospitals were supposed to have a disaster drill. Let's just say they all have a disaster drill. About half of them include a pediatric victim, literally, because they include one pediatric victim. Um, that's what you would see on any given data. So how do you possibly test your ability to take care of a bus crash if you're doing a drill where you have one kid? There's uh, more recent data uh, that I'll get to a little later in the presentation, a substantially larger sample size, a rather impressive sample size, and uh, I won't yet tell you whether we've made progress. Perhaps our biggest progress is that our healthcare system is designed to take care of somebody like me, uh, sadly. Um, uh, so most of the beds, most of the institutions, most of the devices, most of the providers care for are providing care for adults. Uh, and the question is, um, can we create sufficient capacity and capability? So capacity is space, the number of beds, the number of humans. Cap capability is 
can those humans actually care for a special population? Because it probably doesn't really make a difference if you've got the bed if you can't actually provide the care. Um, <clears throat> and this is an issue not just at the hospital level, but it's an issue in the ambulatory care level. It's, as I've already alluded to, an issue in emergency care. It's an issue in the mental health sector as well. Um, and, and then on top of that, uh, this has been more of a more of a recent reminder that we're doing with our federal colleagues is that within that special population there are special populations, and, and that's a uniquely challenging uh, group of patients to care for. So here's a here's a little exercise. So the, there there are several playbooks out there. The HHS policy for surge capacity says that, and it's for all disasters. So I'm not sure that makes sense, but you need 500 beds per 1 million population in terms of defining surge population. So uh, uh, <clears throat> Robert Cantor did this interesting analysis where he looked at the bed capacity in New York State, and they have 242 hospitals. They did. They did at that time, and they had peak inpatients, so number of beds to care for 2,700 kids and nearly 47,000 adults. Uh, over that time frame, the average bed occupancy for kids throughout the year was about 60%. The average bed occupancy for adults over the time frame was 82%. Um, doing the math, he found that there was available 555 beds for adults per 1 million of the population, which you know, it's the criteria whether you think that's the right number, I don't know, but kids are less than half of that. So um, the, the simple problem is most hospitals don't have pediatric beds, and uh, <clears throat> the places where those pediatric beds are located are, are concentrated in great places like this. Um, what do you do about that? Well, one thing to think through is, well, maybe we need to modify our care standards in order to increase our capacity. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so uh, the hub and spoke model is a time-honored uh, concept uh, that promotes both regionalization of care as well as specialization of care. So it makes no sense to have 20 burn centers or 20 pediatric intensive care units in any one state or location because <clears throat> there are not enough patients out there. Really what you want are children coming from, whether it's from nearby or even far away, and this is what happens here. You guys have a very active transport program bringing those kids to that center of excellence. That's great. The problem is, is it also makes us weak because while the children's hospital is really strong and really skilled, all those other places on the periphery, which for years have been sending you their patients, and their patients have been benefiting from that, have become increasingly incapable of caring for kids. Big problem. And so what would happen tomorrow if, God forbid, this facility was inoperable. Uh, let's just call it a major power outage, which is going to keep you from caring for patients for the next week. Who would take care of the kids? Uh, <clears throat> no good answer. And this is the question that would come up anywhere throughout the U.S. Or, or better yet, let's just pretend for a moment that it's the world's worst snowstorm and you can't transport patients for five days or there's a flood. Uh, Again, as you sort of think about what we would do in an, in an environment like that, you sort of have to begin to think through what would happen if I couldn't send a patient to the children's hospital. Um, and then what do you do about that? How do you provide or support care in peripheral locations? Can you work with folks to uh, train them? Can you leverage technology? Uh, you know, we're starting to use telemedicine. Maybe telemedicine is one way to help other. Maybe if farm out some of your providers, so you send an emergency physician or doctor to every hospital or, or, or critical care physician to provide critical care, but uh, you need more than just the doctor providing critical care. Again, you, need, you need the systems in place, you need respiratory therapy, you need the devices, you need nursing, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very complicated. And, and in today's environment where we are all much leaner as institutions, we no longer really have all those excess humans. and and resources that we can farm out to other institutions. So it's a, it's a tremendous challenge. The solution is really through the development of coalitions, and, and this is where the federal government is in terms of their playbook, pushing the concept of coalitions, in part because the federal government can't pay for it all. And the only way this is going to work is if the private sector, children's hospitals, professional organizations and whatnot, come together to solve the problem. Because if, if we wait for the feds to solve this problem, 
it's never going to happen. Um, I mentioned before uh, the, the concept of modifying care standards, and um, I'm guessing that your ICU probably occasionally goes over its it's it's census in terms of numbers of patients, and so you probably have the ability to go a certain percent above your usual bed capacity to provide care, and, and it stretches you a little bit, but it's not a big deal. Maybe it's a big deal. I don't know. It's easy for me to say. I don't work in the ICU. But as you move from sort of that, that next level of sort of increasing your care, and, and folks believe that we really should have the ability to take care of three times our usual number of patients if we really want to get there. How would you do that tomorrow? Uh, well, first of all, you have to find different places to care for the patients outside of the ICU. And again, because you're a high-tech institution, you probably have other beds with monitors. Maybe that works. But who are the providers? And do you then begin to alter the care mix? So maybe you have one nurse per patient or one nurse per two patients. Maybe then becomes one nurse per three patients or four patients or five patients. And as you move down that pathway, you then then have to figure out what you're going to do when your resources are so limited that there are certain things that you may no longer be able to do for patients. Do parents help you? Do some other healthcare provider help you? And again, this is this is the concept of of, of, of crisis care standards. And there's there's there have been a lot of white papers written about this. Uh, uh, most recently, uh, the Institute of Medicine and also the Society for Critical Care Medicine. Um, and uh, but there's no playbook, so this has not been prescribed. But this is really something that I think should be worked on within each local institution. And again, you practice it to a degree because you guys go over census, but it's thinking way beyond that. And um, it's hard to do that when people are otherwise busy and have other things to do. And, and why would we ever want to spend time thinking about what, how we would take care of three times our normal ICU population? Uh, there are also some ethical issues here. Um, Providing care like this is different than providing day-to-day -day care where you where you invest all your resources towards every single patient. Here you have to make critical decisions about who's going to get it. Um, easier said than done. Um, and again, uh, the solution in terms of a global perspective, so well beyond the, the borders of the Children's Hospital, is to, is to really take it to the next level and, and create coalitions. Uh, this is one example of a coalition. Here's a, another example of a Chicago coalition where we don't play very well with each other in Chicago, sadly. Um, you guys are probably already developing coalitions to address a variety of issues that relate to the, the health and well-being of kids. Um, um, and, and I'd suggest you, you start there and you build there. Uh, you build with your local environment and um, again, you, you, you probably have teams that are working on asthma care, perhaps, uh, mental health issues, uh, uh, obesity, I mean, those sorts of things that take a multidisciplinary, multi-provider sort of approach. Um, in this environment, though, you need to think a lot broader than that. Uh, and again, to deal with some of the issues I mentioned, you, you might also include schools and child care providers or professional organizations or non-governmental organizations. But this really gets you out there into the community where you're working with pretty much everybody who constitutes the community towards a unified sort of thought process and a solution. Uh, and it's a lot broader than just simply providing medical care for patients. Uh, I offer EMSC as an example because <clears throat> what's been great about EMSC is that uh, it, it's had the opportunity to bring people together who ordinarily might not like each other very much and might not play well together. Um, and it's like folks take off their, their university jacket, they sit over here, they sit at the table, and they actually work on something that everybody has a great interest in, kids. And so I think EMSC has been a nice model for a coalition, and I think certainly here in Washington, D.C., one that you guys can build upon. Uh, <clears throat> you also need to think a little bigger than that because um, if you're thinking about the big events, you've got to have a plan to care for kids in a much larger perspective. So how would you guys address this as a regional perspective, including the states around Washington, D.C.? Um, and this is the group that you begin to sort of think about the, the care of special populations and how you would you would address surge capacity in an environment larger than your own. Uh, and then how would you, again, leverage 
resources like patient transport because patient transport becomes a key part of this because it's not just transporting the sickest kids to the children's hospital. You actually might be transporting some of the less sick kids to other hospitals that don't quite have all of your bells and whistles so that you've got more space here. Um, I'm reminding myself here that I'm actually not going to talk a lot about mental health today, which is arguably the biggest health impact of disasters um, in terms of its, its global scope. And folks tend to sort of forget about the mental health piece, uh, and the mental health piece needs to be um, part of that. Here's an example of a uh, ad hoc of sorts uh, network, regional network, the Southeast Regional Pediatric Disaster Surge Network. It's uh, it doesn't really functionally operate per se. They have a um, an agreement amongst the, the the providers, and there is a mutual aid that occurs due to this network every time something bad happens in the southeast, such as like a big storm, tornado, whatnot. And uh, this evolved in the aftermath of, of Katrina. Um, and it's a, a great example. You know, the problem with this network, uh, and I know Dr. Andy Rucks very well, is that it's been hard to find funding to support it. Uh, he uh, is, uh, the manuscript is submitted to, did an interesting uh, survey looking for the presence of other coalitions or networks and apparently there are 10 other interstate and seven other intrastate networks that he has identified uh, so uh, that, that hopefully will get uh, will get published so um, um, maybe there is a bit of a foundation out there so there are other pediatric considerations that um, I think need a lot more work. Um, uh, I know this is not my administrator talking to me. Uh, <clears throat> countermeasures. Uh, we've spent a lot of time with our federal partners uh, working on countermeasures. Uh, there's something called the Strategic National Stockpile, which is this large cache. It's hidden in a very secret place. Nobody will tell me where it's located um, because they have to shoot me. Um, but it contains both devices and uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, vaccines, uh, for all those bad things that have been construed to occur. Uh, the, one of the problems with the SNS is actually there's not enough money to sustain it. Uh, so that's a bit of a problem. Uh, <clears throat> and the SNS can't have all those things that you use on a day-to-day -day basis to care for kids. So I don't know what the percentage is, but a large percentage of the medications you use here at this hospital are being provided off label so there are no, there are no FDA indications for their use in kids. Um, that's that's fine. You, you, we, we are licensed to do that. Unfortunately, it's you can't put something in the SNS if it's not licensed for something. So it can be there for another reason. So as an example, midazolam is there. Uh, was there initially as a uh, an anxiolytic? It's actually now because it's been labeled as a um, medication for status epilepticus that can now be used for that as well. And actually some of the, the, the preliminary work was done right here uh, by Jim Chamberlain. Um, so there has to be labeling. And so one of our efforts has been to work with the CD, with the FDA and CDC towards making that happen. And, and again, the FDA is very rigorous in its approach. They're a regulatory agency. And so you just can't ask them to do something. There has to be data. Um, <clears throat> The other problem is, let's just say that they're all there. They then need to be in formulations that are useful for kids. So uh, as you can see with this little one, uh, tough to swallow the capsule. Um, there is some liquid medication in the SNS, but not much. And it's in part because it's very expensive as compared to pills. And it takes up a lot more space and also has some temperature storage issues. So there's great incentive to not have liquid medications in the SNS, not because people don't care about kids, but because there's not enough money to cover all of the components of the SNS. Um, there also then need to be things <clears throat> that allow you to effectively deliver the medication. So auto injectors are terrific. Um, if you don't have a pediatric auto injector, I guess use an adult size one. It would be very difficult to drop a medication into a syringe from a vial, which is, and we have some of that in the SNS if you're wearing protective equipment. So if you're decontaminating humans in a nerve gas event and getting that countermeasure into them will save their life, well, it's hard to do that if it's not in an auto-injector form. Uh, <clears throat> the other problem with kids is that there's a palability issue. So um, 
there's a wonderful video uh, on the CDC website uh, demonstrating uh, how to crush the pills, the Cipro. Um, the problem is, is that you would actually never want to consume that. <coughs> there's some strategies to uh, flavor it, but I don't think any of them are effective. Um, this is a photo taken um, uh, from a border control facility in Texas, uh, but this could be the, you know, the lobby of the Children's Hospital or, 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 or a public building where children have been sort of moved to and there maybe is one adult there watching all of these kids and, and how do you reunify these kids with their adults? Um, um, difficult. Uh, it takes advanced preparation and thinking. Uh, secure sheltering. How do you support these kids for 48 or 72 hours? Uh, um, I, I kind of skipped over triage and treatment because uh, both from a day-to-day -day perspective and also from a mass casualty perspective, there's still not a lot of clarity about the differences between adults and kids in terms of uh, triage. Uh, and in fact, it's been my experience with kids, they're either under or over triage, so uh, you, you never really know what to, what to believe. Um, uh, the good news is, is that with advanced planning and good collaboration between state, local, and the federal government, we can get things right. Uh, so the evacuations that occurred in response to Hurricane Sandy um, occurred without any injury, or at least nobody's talking about it, any injury to patients. Uh, <clears throat> nobody was lost. Everybody was relocated. Um, and they operated under some adverse conditions. I mean, there was loss of power, there was flooding, so this this was no party. Um, and and so with practice, and New York City has practiced a lot, um, we can get better. What we have to aim for, <coughs> excuse me, is resiliency. Because if you um, if you one of your take home points, if you now believe that there's been climate change and that disasters are increasing in their frequency. I don't believe we can prevent disasters. We can have, get better forecasting systems. There are people who sit in dark rooms on Capitol Hill thinking about all those bad things that can happen to us, and they're working on tools to, to actually predict them, which is kind of scary. Um, so the goal is to sort of create an environment uh, so that when the storm washes over us and begins to go away that we, we're, we're still there. Um, and it's about sustaining the ability to withstand and recover. Um, pediatricians play a key role in that. Uh, the medical home is a huge role in that. And if we can work on sort of sustaining and maintaining those components that are important to the health and well-being of kids and provide them with the support, recognizing that some of the kids are going to be very bothered by this and some of the families are going to be terribly troubled by this, then we will be resilient, and really, that's that's that should be our target because there there's never going to be enough money for all sorts of things. But if we we can work towards resilient communities, we will be stronger. And and again, there can be, you know, there's lots of violence out there, and and uh, so it doesn't take anything more than a guy with a handgun to traumatize a community. So uh, important work here. And again, this is where the federal government is is moving. Uh, and I think appropriately so. Uh, this is a, <clears throat> I, I at the time was a member of the National Biodefense Science Board. I'm now its, its chair. Uh, we did a report on community health resilience. And, and the point here is that one of the key underpinnings of a strong community, a resilient community, is its healthcare system. If you have no healthcare system, or if you have an inadequate healthcare system, then you suffer like New Orleans suffered after Katrina. Um, and it's those things that we should rely upon on a day-to-day -day basis that would make us stronger if something really bad happened. And so this is really where we should be aiming as a target. So my question to you all is, are you personally prepared? Uh, because this will happen. This may happen during your tenure here as a resident. If not, it's going to eventually going to happen to you wherever you go next. And are you personally prepared? And is your family prepared? Uh, because if you're personally prepared and your family's prepared, then that puts you in a position to help others. And there's no finer time to be a pediatrician. And again, congratulations for choosing pediatrics as a specialty um, than what we get to do every day, which is to serve kids and families.
And uh, there's no more important time than in the midst of a crisis. Um, so how are we doing? <clears throat> So here's that National Pediatric Readiness Project, and uh, uh, kudos to the EMSC program and the National Research Center right here at the Children's Hospital. But I mean, look at that response rate. Who gets an 82.7% response rate on a survey? Never happen again. This suggests two things. One, that there's strong coalitions that were promoting folks filling out this survey on a state-by-state -state basis. It also is another reminder that actually people care about kids. So again, the good news is, is that we care about something that other people care about, and we need to leverage that more effectively. Uh, and the survey was done for a variety of reasons. One, that the prior data was old, and there was a perception that things had gotten better, and we were kind of tired of talking about the data that suggested we weren't as good. So in fact, the average score uh, did improve, and the sort of the the, the key characteristics that differentiated really prepared hospitals from sort of prepared hospitals, and it didn't make a difference whether you were a little hospital or big hospitals, whether you actually had somebody who was paying attention to this pediatric coordinator. Um, so what about disasters plan, disaster plans? Do you think it went up, went down, or stayed the same? Jim knows the answer. So less than half of U.S. hospitals, and this is a survey, it was easy to check yes. Nobody asked you then said, okay, do you really mean yes? Show me some evidence. So there was probably over-reporting. You can argue maybe people were under-reporting. They're, they're, they're messing with us. But uh, um, this was the largest readiness gap in the survey. So while there's been improvement nationwide in terms of day-to-day -day readiness, there's been very little progress in terms of mass casualty event readiness. So work to be done. <laughs> uh, uh, Referring to the EMSC website, uh, EMSC, and recognizing that this is a problem, has developed a checklist, kind of a tool for hospitals. And again, this was targeted towards hospitals, to um, how they could improve their ability to meet the needs of kids during a disaster. So, um, and um, I, I presume or hope there's some plans in terms of how this is going to get rolled out. Here's a different report card. It's been done since 2008 by Save the Children, and the, the criteria, as you can see on the slide here, are not focused really towards health care. It's about child care and schools. So four criteria, and this is the data from 2015. And as you can see, there are 18 states, including if you want to consider the District of Columbia state. That's an interesting question that we can talk about later. Um, uh, kind of a fun thing, um, uh, didn't meet all criteria. When the survey was first done in 2008, I believe there were four states that actually met all four criteria. There's one state, the loser state is Iowa, uh, where they did not meet any of the criteria. And again, these are structural elements. And the question is, do you have this, yes or no? Nobody actually looked at whether it was a good plan, just do you have a plan? Um, what about our local environment? And so um, uh, the, the folks who should be fronting the most are our good friends in Virginia. Uh, uh, Maryland's um, doing a, 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 a better job, obviously. And, and again, this is about readiness at a child care, school care level. The AAP is working with uh, Save the Children to see if we can get them to kind of maybe add a uh, health care related um, readiness uh, metric to this tool. I was just here in D.C. Uh, in July uh, for this uh, uh, briefing that Save the Children prompted. Uh, they put together this interesting report where they reviewed the recommendations made by the National Commission on Children and Disasters. The National Commission was uh, 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 appeared in legislation in 2007 and began its work in 2008. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this hopefully, but a very strong presence <coughs> in terms of sort of challenging the government to explain itself and to come up with some fairly robust recommendations regarding uh, emergency preparedness. They offered 81 recommendations. Uh, and so Save the Children went back on the 10th anniversary of Katrina and said, okay, so how are we doing with those 81 recommendations? And as you can see in the pie chart and in their large font there, 79% of the recommendations made by the National Commission uh, remain unfulfilled. Uh, well, there's another way to look at this data. Uh, um, actually, we've made progress towards 75% of the recommendations. 
Uh, and the progress has not always been huge, but it's all important. Even the small steps are important. So we've actually made progress, and we made progress because we've, well, the, the National Commission was a bit of sort of a um, kind of a slap across the face to the government. Uh, that we've been sort of working more collaboratively with the government towards the goals that we share, and uh, uh, we've 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 gotten a long way, and, and we, we have uh, several folks here who have contributed to that progress. Uh, here's an interesting blog uh, from uh, uh, Nicole Lurie. She is the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. Um, this office was created in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. She is, in theory, responsible for our nation's disaster readiness. Uh, that's not really entirely true, but <clears throat> that's how the position was created, and so. Uh, there was a blog that appeared in the, the, the Huffington Post, uh, and uh, she actually makes a really important point here, which is if you're waiting for the federal government to solve your problems, do not hold your breath because they can't do it alone. They can't do it alone. They could never do it alone. And really the difference here and what's going to make a difference in Washington, D.C. tomorrow is whether D.C. is ready, not whether the federal government is ready, but whether D.C. is ready. Ditto for Illinois. Ditto for Chicago. Um, and ditto for personal readiness. I grew up in an environment, I grew up in Miami, Florida during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Sort of old. <clears throat> and I remember my parents, they had kind of a disaster closet. And they, it's not because they were disaster geeks. Everybody in the neighborhood did this. Uh, we, we did this in part because of hurricanes. And then we somehow thought that was going to protect us from the bomb, which is ridiculous. Uh, <clears throat> But it was a good idea. Um, but the point is, is that sort of personal readiness kind of faded away. And what we need to do, again, as pediatricians is to work with families to get them prepared. So a decade later, we've made some progress. <clears throat> we've come a long way with legislative advocacy, uh, the National Commission. Uh, we have the reauthorized version of the Pandemic All Hazard and Preparedness Act. Um, and uh, which contained in it the formation of another National Advisory Committee, the National Advisory Committee on Children and Disasters, which is populated with fabulous pediatricians. Uh, we have other federal groups work, working on pediatric needs. Uh, Health and Human Services has a working group. Uh, the, working, the, the entity within government that works on the strategic national stockpile with the FEMC as a group that focuses on the needs of kids and uh, pregnant women. Um, uh, in the aftermath or with the H1N1 outbreak, the CDC stood up a pediatric desk, which it has sort of a, a pediatric entity in its emergency operations center, which has been sustained since then. Uh, so they actually are looking proactively. We've, we've, again, made some small progress, not big progress on countermeasures. We've made tremendous progress working with the CDC and others in terms of creating joint clinical guidance. Um, and again, we're, while we're continuing to sort of do what we can to improve response and readiness, it's all about res resiliency. And if nothing else, we've created great awareness of the problem. So uh, it's a good thing. Uh, in, in terms of ongoing needs, well, <clears throat> Got to continue the advocacy. You can never really stop. And, and arguably, where we need to focus our attention as, as a professional organization is probably at the state and local sector. Um, uh, there's a big day-to-day -day issue with provider and responder education and training in terms of the care of kids. That becomes even greater during a mass casualty event. Uh, we've got to take those mass casualty care, crisis care standards, and coalition concepts and operationalize them. Easier said than done. Mental health, which again I am not talking nearly enough about today, is, is a huge unmet gap. Um, personal readiness, uh, community resiliency. We also need data. There is there there is a great need for a research agenda in disaster preparedness and arguably um, funding to support some important work. Um, so I'm going to take the shorter version today. So what's been the secret recipe? Um, um, this is the original version of How to Win Friends and Influence People, which I've never read. Um, but it's all about advocacy. We are where we are today, both on this issue and other issue, because there are people who have been tireless champions of kids, whether it's on Capitol Hill or at your, you know, your, your mayor's office or uh, your, your EMS agency. Um, 
And um, the good news is, is that we've made progress, we've made connections. The bad news is that we can never stop. If you've ever been to Capitol Hill, every single entity, roofers, teachers, pharmacists, you name the entity or interest group, kids, um, school kids, are wandering the halls doing what we should be doing, which is talking to elected officials, usually talking to some staff member <clears throat> who just graduated from Georgetown or something like that, but uh, uh, it's really important. Um, we made a lot of progress during the National Commission. A commission is very different than an advisory committee. An advisory committee, we offer suggestions. Commissions actually don't necessarily mandate anything, but <clears throat> there's a very different relationship there. And, and so we made tremendous, it was a tremendous platform. Uh, it provided a captive audience. In other words, the feds had to show up because they were mandated to do that. And they figured out over time that we weren't their enemies, we were actually their friends. We also convinced them that we were not just a bunch of whiny special interest group folks. It's like, well, we can't do something for kids because then we have to do something for everybody, right? Uh, <clears throat> to we're actually subject matter experts, and not just on kids, but on a broader issue, which is why you see pediatricians and other federal advisory committees and that we're a valued partner. We can actually help them get something out there that practitioners might find useful, like clinical guidance. Uh, we have located incredible pediatricians, real pediatricians who work in government, and we've also identified other pediatric thinkers in government. Again, for the most part, everybody likes kids. We've infiltrated their process, whether it's on advisory committees, at certain meetings, and through the legislative process. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has been a very effective advocate on Capitol Hill. Um, we've also tried to acknowledge progress made and, uh, of course, never stop. Uh, <clears throat> one of my inspirational thoughts here, so um, slow progress is still progress. I think that's, that's true for a number of things in life, and that's very true for this. And you need to acknowledge the progress even when it's like, God, I can't believe we only took one half step. Because that's what will get them to take the other half step. Telling them that they've not met 75% of the recommendations is the wrong way to approach it. So become knowledgeable. There's a lot of information out there. <clears throat> Some wonderful resources to uh, look at. The AAP has a fabulous website. Partner with others that are already thinking about this. Um, teach them about kids volunteer your knowledge and experience, advocate at all levels, create a coalition, work with others to introduce pediatric considerations into how people look at the local environment. I mean, where are the risks? Schools, as an example. Uh, leverage your role in the medical home by, by educating patients and families, and as well patients, first responders and officials. And again, if nothing else, <clears throat> be personally prepared because from a selfish perspective, it could happen tomorrow, so think about it. Better yet, if you want to come here and help others, you can't do that if you're worried about your family. So it's the right thing to do. Just do it. Uh, uh, nice quote from Robert E. Kennedy. And there will be a ripple effect. So what you do here will affect other layers. And again, this is, an, this is a unique children's hospital because you're not just still another children's hospital in the city or the children's hospital in our nation's capital. Some uh, great resources out there, including a nice little piece on the progress we've made since Katrina. The MSC website is another great resource. Um, Prefer to that. And I will end with this picture of a local mass casualty drill. And uh, the sport coat actually no longer fits like a glove. But um, thank you for listening. So thank you, Dr. Krug. That was a, a, a very um, inspirational talk because I think it tied into a lot of stuff that's important to us here at Children's National, some things that we're doing well, and it sounds like a lot of things that we still have yet to do. We may have maybe a minute for one or two questions, and I wanted to throw it out to the audience if anyone had any questions or points they wanted to bring up. Dr. Teach? So, Steve, uh, great, great talk. You know, a lot of what we try to do in pediatrics is based on best practice, and best practice is always established by, uh, you know, comparative effectiveness research and, and concepts like that. Um, obviously, uh, trying to do that in faster seems a little bit um, difficult at best. Have there been any talk to actually uh, randomize trials of response in the context of disaster? Well, there's. First of all, 
well, you can do a lot in a simulation environment, um, and um, you know that's a good way of sort of looking at how we care for patients, and it's also a, an interesting way uh, if you approach a simulation a drill um, where you can sort of anticipate where those practices are. Part of the problem uh, in disaster readiness is that there is exceedingly little data. What's been written about it is mostly um, people writing about their ideas. Uh, there have been very few studies. Uh, one of the things that the current ASPR is quite interested in is uh, research readiness as it relates to disaster. And there are efforts that are already out there that have put together IRBs to evaluate. So as an example, if we had to start treating people for anthrax, there is a pre-populated IRB proposal that would be rolled out that would allow, because the vaccine would have to be delivered to children under an investigational new drug trial because it's not labeled and there's no data. Um, there, so there would be a mechanism in place to study whether that was effective or not. Um, they have done some research after events, um, and I know that one of the goals is to have those systems in place so that we can do this, whether it's at an institution level or at a, really more at a, at a local community level, if something like that were hap to happen. And nobody knows what the best practices are, to your point. And um, uh, again, a, a, a tough thing to study, but we, if we ever want to get better at this, we need to have those thoughts in place before something happens so that we can learn from the events. Point well taken. So um, Dr. Krug will be here with us today also in the emergency department um, for a bit. Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately, at this point, but certainly we thank him for um, returning to Children's National.